Jeff, what brings us to the back roads of Trumbull, Connecticut? I grew up just a few towns over from here, Ray, and I remember hearing a story about, well, people who lived out in these woods. All right, I don't like how you just said people right there. Yeah, I get that. We think they're human, but around here, locals refer to these elusive folks as the melon heads. Hey, I'm Jeff Belanger. And I'm Ray Osier. And welcome to episode 56 of the New England Legends podcast. If you give us about 10 minutes, we'll give you something strange to talk about today. Hey, Ray, what day does your birthday fall on next year? I don't know. It's still a half a year away. Well, I can tell you that your birthday falls on a Sunday. Wow. What are you using, witchcraft? Mm Mm-hmm. How could you possibly gain such insight into the future, Jeff? Well, Ray, no, I have no magic powers. It's nothing like that. I have a brand new copy of my 2019 Haunted New England Wall Calendar featuring the eerie photography of Frank Grace. Each month, we cover a haunt and legend from somewhere in New England with Frank's creepy and stunning photographs and my stories. It's the fifth year we've actually produced this limited edition calendar. Well, Jeff, how can I get one so I, too, can find out which day of the week my birthday falls? Ray, I'm so glad you asked. (laughs) If you go to our website at OurNewEnglandLegends.com, you'll see a link on the right-hand side of the page where you can purchase the calendar online. And you can also get them from me at any of my upcoming programs on my fall lecture tour, and all of those dates and places can be found on our website as well. All right. Well, thank you for the shameless plug, Jeff. You're welcome. Now, if we find one of these melon heads, we could try to sell them a calendar. (laughs) Perfect. But what exactly is a melon head? The stories of the Connecticut melon heads have been around since just after World War II. They're described as kind of a small, deformed human with a grossly oversized head. That sounds like the 1990s movie Mars Attacks. Yeah, the Martians in that movie. I, I get it. But no one's accusing the melon heads of being from outer space. All right, where are we going now? Here in Trumbull, we're looking for Velvet Street. It's this heavily wooded back road that runs by the Easton Reservoir. But right. locals, especially the younger ones, they refer to this dark street as Dracula Drive. Dracula Drive? Dracula Drive. And uh, I'm, okay, I'm just gonna turn right up here. Okay, this is it. Welcome to Dracula Drive. Wow. This is Trumbull's epicenter for not just melon head sightings, but other strange reports as well. Like? Well, people claim their cars will mysteriously shut down. Wow. Radios go haywire. They say when you drive down this road, especially at night, you'll see these figures of people standing on the side of the road. Ooh. If your car stops, that's when the melon heads run out and confront you. What do they want? I think they mostly want to just be left alone. So scaring you off is the top priority. But this one story surfaced back in the 1980s about some teenagers from Notre Dame High School in nearby Fairfield, Connecticut. They came out to this very road looking for the melon heads one Friday night. And what happened? Well, the teenagers pulled over. They got out of their sky blue Ford Granada and walked into the woods looking for the hidden home of the melon heads. As they get a little deeper into the forest, they suddenly hear a noise behind them. Someone started up their car. They run back to the street, ready to confront the car thief, and then they see the car barreling down the road right at them. The Ford Granada narrowly misses the kids who dive into the woods. But as the car passes by, they catch a glimpse of an angry-looking man with a huge head behind the wheel. What happened to the teenagers? Well, they had to walk back to town and find a payphone to call their parents for a ride. That sky-blue Ford Granada was never recovered. Wow. Well, I want to know how far back these stories go. You said earlier they show up post-World War II. Right. So I did some digging. Well, what'd you find? Well, first, Trumbull, Connecticut isn't the only town to lay claim to the home of the Melonheads. Okay. People have also said you can find them off of Zion Hill Road in Milford, Connecticut. Okay. Sawmill City Road in Shelton, Connecticut. All right. And others have reported them in Monroe, Stratford, Seymour, Weston, Easton, Oxford, Southbury, Bethel, and Fairfield. (laughs) (laughs) Man, they get around. Yeah. Okay, but I notice all the towns you name there, they're mainly in the southwestern part of Connecticut. Well, today this region is almost considered a suburb of New York City. Right, okay. People live out here and commute into the city each day by car or train. But back in the 1940s and 50s, that wasn't the case. Connecticut was the boonies. And where there's boonies, <laughs> strange stories will follow. That's very true. Now, after World War II, people were moving away from the city and into the more suburban life. Right. Over the decades, these towns expanded in population. Then folks started talking about strange locals with big heads. 
Some claim these melon heads escaped from Fairfield Hills Mental Hospital long ago. Oh, hey, that's in Newtown, Connecticut, yeah. where I grew up. We used to play soccer on the grounds of that hospital. Wow. I mean, everyone knew it had a haunted reputation. Yeah, I've seen pictures, and the place looks pretty creepy. Yeah. Didn't they once film an episode of MTV's Fear there back in the 2000s with Ed and Lorraine Warren? Yeah, they did. They did. And, and I first met Ed and Lorraine Warren when I was a teenager. They lived in Monroe, which is the next town over. So was there ever an escape from Fairfield Hills? Actually, there were plenty of escapes over the years. Mm. You have to remember, this wasn't a prison. Yeah. It, it, it's some patients just wandered off sometimes. And that only adds to the legend of the Melonheads. Well, given how rural Connecticut was back before New York City spilled into southern New England, some claim the Melonheads were a family of outcast witches hmm. who had lived out in the woods for generations, inbreeding, and, you know, that led to physical deformity. Well, historically speaking, a tribe of people keeping to themselves in the woods isn't really unheard of. Hmm. Just after the U.S. Civil War in the Appalachian area of the United States, there was a group of people they called the Melungeon. Like Melon Gen? Exactly. Ah. This group of people were a mixed race of Europeans, freed African slaves, and Native Americans. And the group kind of kept to themselves since the mid-1800s and lived out way far away from society. People also accused them of inbreeding to keep their line going over generations. Maybe some of that group ventured northeast and set up their own clan in Connecticut? Well, throwing a physical deformity, a Melungeon earns a cruel nickname, Melonheads. Inbreeding happened in various cultures throughout time. I mean, sometimes it was because there was no one else around. Sometimes it happened for religious reasons. Sure. And while we mostly picture dirt poor hillbillies when it comes to this, if we head over to Europe and Africa, we learn that sometimes it was a community's highest ranking families who were inbreeding. What? Why would they do that? <laughs> to preserve royal bloodlines. Oh. First cousins, second cousins, and third cousins were all on the table when it came to royal <laughs> matrimony matches. All right. And sometimes the relations were even closer than that. No. Yeah. I, the only thing closer than a first cousin is... Yeah, oh. exactly. If I ask you to name the first ancient Egyptian king that comes to mind, you would say... Steve Martin's King Tut, or King, King Tut. Yeah. Of course, King Tut. So, not the most influential guy by a long shot, mm. but most famous because his burial crypt was intact when it was discovered in November of 1922. Right, all the treasure and body was just as it was when Tutankhamun was buried roughly in 1323 B.C. He became king when he was just 10 years old. And then died when he was only 19. So you fast forward to modern day, and Tut's body has been x-rayed, CAT scanned, DNA sequenced, and examined every which way to the point where we know quite a bit about him. Yeah. So it's likely he had a cleft palate, a club foot, scoliosis, and an elongated and deformed skull. Wow. And the reason for all these deformities, in this case, was that his parents, well... They were brother and sister. Oh, man, that's really gross. And back then, it was common practice to preserve these royal bloodlines and keep it pure. Wow. It happened in Europe as well, though brother and sister matrimony became more rare, probably because it was learned through a lot of trial and error that the offspring rarely <laughs> came out right. Well, multiply that over generations, and incest goes from being en vogue among royalty to something that's well, universally taboo. Yeah, exactly. And if you want beautiful, healthy children, your best bet is someone genetically diverse from you. Mm. So, you know, stop trolling family reunions when you're <laughs> looking for a date. So now these melon heads are assumed to be the product of inbreeding, which is so taboo in modern times that we look at the offspring as well, some kind of monster. If you read through the literature from the 1940s, the term melonhead became this pejorative for anyone you thought was an idiot. So a guy cuts you off in traffic. He's a melon head. Exactly. And this is when this legend starts to make me uncomfortable, Ray. Why? There's a medical condition called hydrocephalus. It's commonly called water on the brain. Okay. It can cause an infant's head to swell dramatically, like double in size. Wow. But there are also other physical deformities that can occur in people even when there's no inbreeding involved at all. I see where you're going with this. I mean, go back a century or less to a time when people were even less tolerant than they are now. And folks with physical deformities would move away from town just so they wouldn't get hassled. There was a time less than two centuries ago when families kept their children with mental retardation and physical deformities literally chained up in their basement. Or they had them incarcerated in jails because it was seen as such an embarrassment to the family. That's terrible. I agree. And we've come a long way in that regard. In the mid-1800s, the psychiatrist named Thomas Kirkbride came along and started designing beautiful campuses where people with physical and mental abnormalities could lead productive lives. Fairfield Hills Hospital in Newtown was built using a lot of Kirkbride's concepts. 
So now these people aren't being held in prisons or chained in basements, but that doesn't mean society changes overnight. No, it doesn't. You don't have to go too far back to find that openly mocking people with these deformities and disabilities happen freely in society. Only in recent decades is it becoming socially unacceptable to do so. Now, if we go back to the first half of the 20th century, sometimes people who didn't look or act like everybody else moved out in the woods or to the outskirts of town to avoid cruel torment they would face walking down Main Street each day. Which just makes them more intriguing and monster-like. Then people come out here to these woods, and they look for these folks, and they gawk at them like some carnival sideshow, which no doubt upsets these people, and the legend just grows. So you're saying that the melon heads are probably real. Yeah, I think and so. And they show up all over because there are people with physical deformities all over the place who probably try to hide from society. And here we are driving down this road in Trumbull looking for someone who may at one time have lived here and suffered from a medical condition more than being a monster. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's time to turn the car around and go home, Jeff. Some of these legends and stories can be a downer, but that doesn't mean they don't have something to teach us. And that's why we chase them all each week on our podcast, on our website, and in our super secret Facebook group. This movement has been growing week by week. More of you legendary listeners are sharing your stories, and we're connecting with so many others who chase these kinds of things. And we'd love your help on our Patreon page. Just go to patreon.com slash New England Legends, and for as little as three bucks per month, you can get early access to new episodes, plus access to bonus episodes of our podcast that no one else gets to hear but you. Our expenses have been rising as our show's been growing, so we'd love for you to help. If you're listening to the podcast each week, maybe watching the New England Legends series on Amazon Prime, consider helping us out. A little goes a long way. Our theme music is, of course, by John Judd. And until next time, remember, the bazaar is closer than you think.